Hi there, I'm Dr. Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. In this video, I'd like to talk about the importance of blinding in a randomized control trial. There are a couple of biases that can arise that uh, blinding can help ameliorate, and we'll discuss those in this video. So what is blinding? Blinding is keeping people involved in the study unaware of the treatment group assignment after randomization. There's a type of blinding of the randomization process itself called allocation concealment that we won't talk about here, but I'll talk about in another video. And by convention, there's three types of blinding, single blind, double blind, and triple blind. In single blind, we only blind the patient. In double blind, we blind both the patient and the researchers. And in triple blind, we blind the patient, the researchers, statisticians, and outcome assessors. Now, some authors of papers use these terms in a different fashion, but it's important to look at the paper and see who exactly they blind. If they don't tell you, assume this convention. So knowing what group you're in can have an effect on your thoughts about the study. So if you're a participant, you come into a study having an expectation that if you get the new therapy, you're going to gain benefit, not have harms. And so these favorable expectations and assumptions can impact how you interpret your experiences during the study. For patients who know they're on the control intervention, they may be uh, disappointed and feel deprived. And all this can affect the rates of compliance with study procedures, protocols, and medications, and also whether or not patient stays in the study. Same thing for investigators. They do a study coming into it with sort of preconceived notions um, of what impact they expect to see from the intervention. They can transfer these attitudes toward patients, and it can result in differential use of ancillary testing and interventions on patients, their decisions to withdraw patients from the study, how they adjust the medications, um, how they assess outcomes, etc. So blinding is very important because it can help reduce those things that we just discussed on the last slide, and we name those performance bias and ascertainment and detection bias. So what is performance bias? Well, performance bias are systematic differences between groups in a study um, in the care that's provided. So for example, if the researchers know what study arm somebody's in, they may do differences uh, or get, provide different ancillary treatments to one group over the other, offer different testing, do different kinds of follow-up. And it's not related to the protocol because sometimes protocols have differences in how the two groups are treated, but this is doing things systematically purely based on the knowledge of what group they're in. Ascertainment or detection bias is systematic differences in how outcomes are determined. So researchers may look harder or look differently in one group versus another that's outside the protocol that's only done because they know what group somebody's in. So that's why it's important for blinding. Now, how do we do blinding? Well, most commonly in a therapy type study, it's going to be using a placebo. And a placebo is essentially a sugar tablet. It's a pill that looks the same, smells the same, tastes the same, feels the same, except that it doesn't have an active ingredient in it. So patients and um, people involved in the study couldn't look at an active pill and a placebo and tell which one is which. You can also do something called a sham intervention. And a good example is a, a study um, from a few years ago where it was thought that if you wash out the evil humors um, from an arthritic joint, that patients with degenerative arthritis in the knee would do better. So they did an arthroscopic study where, or they did a randomized study where they randomized people to arthroscopic wash out of their joint, and the control group got a sham intervention where patients were put to sleep, they had trocars put in the knee, manipulation of the knee, except there was no washout. So this raises some ethical concern, but it really did strengthen the findings of that study because the only thing that was truly different between the two groups um, was that one group got a washout and the other group didn't. And usually what's done in studies is that you code the study group assignment. And this isn't going to usually be talked about too much in a study um, in the, what's written up in a journal, but it's an important thing that's done. It's usually one of the ways that you maintain um, the blinding in a study is you, is you don't have group A got placebo, group B got whatever the intervention is, you have some coding and the code uses isn't broken until after the study is complete. And there's three things to think about here. Blinding, while it's important, is not as important for objective outcomes. So things like death are objective. Something like cause of death is subjective. So things that are objective, blinding isn't quite as important. And sometimes you can't always blind people. So if we do a surgical versus a medical intervention, it's hard to blind those folks. They can usually figure out what arm they're in. And also, a lot of times, the intervention that we do might have physiologic effects. So if we did a beta blocker um, study and we randomized patients to beta blockers versus placebo, you might be able to figure out what arm you're in because the beta blocker arm, their blood pressures are going to go down, their heart rates are going to go down. Um, also, 
Um, if you can't blind people in the study, um, like the patients or the researchers, the next best thing you can do is blind the people who determine the outcomes of the study, so the outcome assessment group. As long as they're blinded, you'll mitigate some of the effects of other groups not knowing um, the, what, or other groups knowing what arm the of the study patients were assigned to. And finally, sometimes we purposely break blinding. So if one group's gaining a lot more benefit than the other, and we determine that it's unethical to continue to withhold that therapy from the other group, then we we'll often break blinding and then provide that therapy to everyone in the study. Conversely, if there's excessive harm in one arm, we'll break blinding to make sure we stop um, the harmful agent. So how might blinding look in a study? So this is a little excerpt from a study of spironolactone uh, compared, um, or I mean, just say spironolactone patients with advanced heart failure. And the researchers tell us this is a double blind study, but they don't really say who's blinded. So we have to assume it's researchers and the patient. And they use a placebo to accomplish their blinding. And one of the things they did is they measured serum potassium. So do you think the researchers and patients could figure out that they were on spironolactone or not? Well, they probably could because spironolactone can raise your potassium and in a lot of patients it causes breast pain so if you had these things you'd probably figure out that you're on the spironolactone group but one of the things they did is they had people who were assessing outcomes they were blinded to which arm people were in so the data safety monitoring board was blinded and also the event committee was blinded and you can see here at the very bottom the outcome was death and hospitalization and you may say well that's pretty objective blinding may not be as important but if you look next to it, it says causes of death and reasons for hospitalization, and that can be subjective. And if the researchers knew somebody was on spironolactone and they had a preconceived notion that spironolactone was gonna be good and prevent hospitalization for heart failure, they may subconsciously or even consciously assign the cause of hospitalization to something else, let's say pneumonia, um, instead of heart failure. So you can see why it's important to, to blind people, especially for subjective outcomes. I hope this video has helped you understand the importance of blinding in a randomized control trial. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.